morning, everybody. I'm Mark Krell. I'm a movement disorder neurosurgeon. I was recruited down here from Stanford uh, to start actually a movement disorder and epilepsy surgical program. Uh, so uh, thank you, Jessica, for having me to talk about movement disorder surgery with you folks. So we'll, we'll talk today mainly about DBS as it relates to movement disorder, but we'll give a little bit of background first on movement disorder and movement disorder surgery. All right, so what is Parkinson's disease? Anybody wanna hazard a guess as to what actually the definition of Parkinson's disease is? Not what your experience is, but what is Parkinson's disease? That's a, that's a good broad view of it, but it's a combination of motor and non-motor symptoms. The motor symptoms include rigidity, speech problems, resting tremor, slowed movements, shuffling steps, and postural instability. Anyone have one or more of these? All right. And then there are the non-motor symptoms, decreased sense of smell, depression or mood problems, pain, uh, insomnia, uh, bladder or bowel dysfunction, and fatigue. Anyone have any of these? <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, the, the DBS acts essentially as a, another medication. And so it's very good at treating the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, not as good at treating the non-motor symptoms. Now, with that said, the original indication for DBS actually was for psychiatric disorders. Uh, it, it, we then found that it was useful for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So there are targets that can be used for the psychological aspects, but for Parkinson's disease, that's not the primary thrust. So who's affected by Parkinson's disease? There are 10 million people worldwide uh, who are affected by this progressive degenerative movement disorder uh, marked by a decrease in dopamine producing cells in the brain. Now, any of the medications for Parkinson's disease will generally be used to affect the dopamine pathways in the brain, either by directly giving dopamine or by preventing its reuptake or by stimulating its release. One million Americans and 10 million people worldwide are affected, and 1% of all people over 55 are known to be affected right now. And I stress known to be affected right now because as we gain better understanding of the spectrum of Parkinson's disorders and better diagnostic techniques, we're finding more and more patients that have Parkinson's disease. Now, what are our options for treating? The first and most effective treatment for treating Parkinson's disease is exercise, which I imagine is why many of you are here. The next is medication. As we talked about, we stimulate or uh, alter the dopamine pathway, and uh, most uh, chiefly, these are the L-DOPA, so the Cinemet uh, or the Riteri for the long-acting version. Next up is deep brain stimulation, uh, where a small battery-powered device is placed under the collarbone. And uh, that device is either rechargeable or interchangeable, and uh, it's modifiable to change the stimulation parameters as the disease progresses. Next is neurorehabilitation, and neurorehabilitation works best in concert with these other things, so the exercise, medication, DBS, and then neurorehabilitation, where the uh, rehab specialists will train you in living with your new normal because even though these things can get you to a point where you're functioning well, you're not necessarily the same person you were 15, 20, 30 years ago. So they, they teach you how to navigate the world in the circumstance of having all of these modifiers. And the last step is ablative surgery. Now, ablative surgery is different than DBS. DBS is neuromodulation, meaning you're changing the function of the brain, you're changing the brain parameters, you're changing the way dopamine works in the circuit, but with ablative surgeries, you're actually destroying tissue. Matter of fact, the first surgery for Parkinson's disease was an accidental ablation. Uh, so Wilder Penfield uh, was doing a tumor surgery and he accidentally ligated the anterior choroidal artery, which is the artery that supplies the basal ganglia, the, the motor circuit that uh, subtends Parkinson's disease. When he accidentally destroyed that artery, the patient had a stroke in the basal ganglia and the Parkinson's stopped. There was no more tremor. Of course, they had a stroke, so there were other problems, but there was no more tremor. And so that was how we discovered that the basal ganglia was somehow related to the Parkinsonian tremor. And from there, they started doing ablative surgeries where they would on purpose give the patient a stroke, destroying the tissue, and the tremor would go away. We've gotten much more precise about the ablation. We're not just stroking basal ganglias to treat tremor, but this is still a last step because with ablation, there is no going back. 
So if you get a side effect, if you don't get sufficient tremor control, you get what you get because the tissue is destroyed. Versus with DBS, it's very, very extensively modifiable. So as the disease progresses, and I want to be clear, DBS is not a cure for Parkinson's disease. It does change the slope of decline with Parkinson's disease. So instead of, for lack of a better way of putting it, falling off a cliff, the, the Parkinson's disease progression is much slowed. And uh, so as that disease progresses and you modify the DBS settings, you can keep up with the progression of the disease, keeping you at a functional level. So what is deep brain stimulation? As I mentioned, there are two different kinds of batteries. Whoa, I just got really loud. <laughs> there are two different kinds of batteries. Uh, there's a non-rechargeable, which is a little bit bigger because it needs a, a larger battery pack to last for several years or the rechargeable that's smaller uh, and obviously rechargeable. These down here are what the electrodes look like. This is a non-directional electrode and this is a directional electrode. The directional electrodes are a, a new advent, relatively speaking, and uh, not that I've ever made a mistake, but sometimes we, we can misplace the electrodes. And by misplace, we're talking about nuclei that are three to five millimeters in diameter. So misplace is a fraction of a millimeter. With the non-directional electrodes, we have a much longer span, as you can see on the picture, so we can get larger areas of tissue. But with the directional electrodes, we have the ability to steer the field in the direction that we want. With the old electrodes, the, the field was a sphere around the tip of the electrodes. So again, like the ablation, you got what you got. If the electrode was in a good place, you got good therapy. If it wasn't, you didn't. Nowadays, uh, although we still are extraordinarily precise, if we're a fraction of a millimeter off, we have the ability to drive the field to get you the maximum benefit with the minimum side effect. And uh, the, the battery sits under the, the collarbone like, uh, like a pacemaker would. Uh, so if you've ever seen somebody with a pacemaker, that's what the DBS battery looks like sitting under your skin. Uh, any questions so far? All right. So one thing that, that I want to make clear is that DBS is not experimental. Actually, I should say two things I want to make clear. DBS is not experimental, and it is not a treatment of last resort. The old way of thinking is that when the patient has failed dopamine therapy, send them off the to the neurosurgeon for DBS. It actually doesn't work. Uh, it turns out that DBS is only effective as long as medication is effective. So if you're at the point where you're no longer responsive to medication, either you're on the wrong medication or you've exceeded the window of DBS as well. Uh, like I would said earlier, DBS acts as a medication. So if the medication doesn't work, the DBS won't either. Uh, there have been over 200,000 people in the US that have DBSs currently, uh, or that have been implanted. Not all of them are still with us, but there, there are 200,000 that, that have, have been implanted. And as I had mentioned, it pr uh, primarily helps with the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, tremor reduction, bradykinesia, and rigidity. Two things it doesn't help well, uh, help well with. First is the balance. So if people have balance issues, they may actually get worse from, from the DBS. Uh, it does still help the tremor. It does still help the bradykinesia. But balance in and of itself is not helped by DBS. If the balance is because of posture, the DBS can help. But if, if the balance is because of the brain, it doesn't. The other thing it's not great at helping with is freezing, which is different than slowness of movement or bradykinesia. Uh, but freezing is where you try to initiate movement and it, the body just doesn't listen. Uh, there are ongoing research projects now on how to address freezing of gait with DBS, so we will get there. Uh, but at this moment, freezing is not helped by DBS. And it also helps with medication complications. There are two primary targets for Parkinson's disease with, for DBS. There are a handful of others, but two primaries. Uh, and we'll talk about what they are and why in just a minute. Uh, but with the two targets that we use for DBS, uh, for Parkinson's disease, they either allow you to reduce the, the medication dosing and frequency that you're taking, or they treat the side effects of the medication. And patient selection is different between the two, uh, and that's a little bit outside the scope of, of what we're talking about here today and very individualized. But uh, what the DBS does is it basically... The way you can think about it is the best that you ever are on medication 
is what you can expect to be on DBS all the time, rather than having the on-off fluctuation with medication, and simultaneously reducing the actual number of pills and the dosing that you take in a day. 96% of patients are satisfied with their DBSs, uh, and if, if given the choice, those same 96% would choose to undergo the procedure again. So the, the typical patient's DBS journey is exploring treatment options, uh, which I'm sure for none of you is today your first day with Parkinson's disease, so I'm sure you've explored options. Uh, have an evaluation with a DBS surgeon. Uh, I, I happen to be the only one in town, but I'm not the only person who does DBS. There are plenty of us out there. Uh, you have your surgery to implant the lead. You have surgery to implant the, the stimulator. And then you follow with neurology for several months uh, to optimize your programming. And the programming, again, is customized to the patient. So the programming that works for me may be very different than the programming that works for you. Uh, and part of that programming is minimizing side effects. Because we are playing in such small areas of the brain, uh, certain programming can have side effects that are undesirable, so we balance the, the treatment efficacy with reducing the side effects. Uh, most of these surgeries are done awake. Uh, we can do them certainly asleep, uh, but many of them are done awake so that we, in real time as we're putting the leads in, can make sure that you're getting good control of the symptoms that you're trying to control and not having side effects. And it's nice to do it while you're in surgery so we don't have to go back to surgery and move the lead, but rather during the surgery itself we know good position, good efficacy, no side effects. Make sense? When medication is no longer working, DBS will not work. That's the, that's the indication where DBS helps. If you have no response to medication, you will not respond to DBS. If you have frequent fluctuation and you're taking the medications frequently where it's interrupting your life or where you're having side effects from the medication, that's the golden window for DBS. So, it, I mean, that doesn't mean we have to do your surgery today now, but you're, you're in the position where DBS is right for you. Thank you. And that's actually, you preempted the next slide. Uh, the, timing of <laughs> the timing of implanta implantation uh, in the Parkinson's disease arc uh, is that golden window. And that, that's a more recent discovery. Like I said, we, we've historically thought that we, we reserve DBS for patients that have failed conservative management, which is medication. And that's actually incorrect. You, you don't really need DBS when you have mild symptoms that are well controlled by medication. You know, the folks that are taking Cinemet 25100 twice a day, morning and night, and then they do great out in the world, those really aren't the people that should undergo the risk of surgery. The people in the middle where they have moderate to advanced symptoms with an increased need for medication where it's an intolerable burden on their life, they have the frequent on-off fluctuations or they have intolerable side effects from the medication, either liver injury or nausea or orthostatic hypotension or all the other side effects that can happen with the medication, those are the patients who are right for DBS now. Once they get to the point where they have severe symptoms with an unpredictable or no response to medication, they are no longer a candidate for DBS. Because again, the risk of the surgery does not, uh, is not justified by the amount of relief that they would get from the, the surgery itself. This is an honest to God brain surgery. Uh, so you don't wanna be poking around in there if you're not gonna help the patient. So a potential DBS candidate is somebody who has idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which means Parkinson's disease that happens just because it happened, not Parkinson's disease that's secondary to something. Uh, so uh, there, there is Parkinson's disease, and then there's Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism uh, are patients that have signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but do not have the brain disorder associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, somebody that has tremor because of trauma, somebody that has tremor because of alcohol withdrawal, somebody that has slowness of movement because of multi-system atrophy, somebody that has shy drager syndrome. They will look like Parkinson's disease to somebody that doesn't see these diseases all day every day, but those are not Parkinson's disease, and so those patients will not be helped by DBS. Uh, they still have to be responsive to dopaminergic therapy, the, the L-DOPA, uh, Agonist, Riteri, Cinemet, uh, the, uh, uh, the disease-modifying medications, all of those. Uh, and they have on-off fluctuations that are increasing in frequency or amplitude, exactly like you just described. Troublesome dyskinesias. Dyskinesias are the side effect of the Parkinson's medication. Anybody seen Michael J. Fox on TV recently? 
So the movements that he's having when you see him on TV is not the Parkinson's disease. Those are dyskinesias that are a side effect from the medication. For him, if he were to not take the medication, he would be frozen. Uh, and he has made the, the choice to take such a high dose of medication that he has side effects in order to be able to move at all. And refractory tremor, uh, where the, the tremor, not the other features, not the, not the, uh, the slowness of movement, not the, uh, the cognitive dysfunction, not other things, but the tremor itself stops responding to medication, those people are still candidates for DBS. Now, people who are not DBS candidates are pe uh, people who suffer from dementia. Every single person. Uh, so the youngest patient I've ever implanted with a DBS was 14. Even her, every single person that is a candidate for DBS gets a thorough neuropsychological evaluation. Because again, this is honest to God brain surgery. And if I'm implanting something into your brain, I wanna know ahead of time that your brain has enough cognitive reserve to be able to withstand the impact of putting something through your brain. Uh, and and the, the neuropsych assessment is not because anybody thinks you're crazy, it's not because anybody thinks you have a psychological disorder, but it's because we need to measure your cognitive baseline before we start talking about the procedure. And it does not disqualify anybody, but it does change the conversation we have. Many people come through and the neuropsychologist says that they, they're a good candidate for DBS on cognitive grounds. Handful of people are not as good candidates, and all that means is that you and I have a conversation where we say, listen, we can do the surgery, but there is a risk that we will change your cognition by doing the surgery, and then you decide as the patient whether you want to take that risk or not. We also don't offer DBS for patients that have medical conditions that prevent surgery. Somebody that has a bleeding disorder, for example, would be too high of a risk for implanting something in the brain because the last thing we want to do is in trying to help you, hurt you. If somebody that has a bleeding disorder, as we're passing the, the wire through the brain, we may cause a big stroke. So we don't do surgery on those patients. And lastly, patients that have progressed to late stage Parkinson's, patients that no longer have the ability to feed themselves, uh, not because of movement, but because they, they just can't put the motor steps together, patients that are totally frozen, uh, patients that, that have significant cognitive decline, the late stage Parkinson patients, are no longer candidates for DBS. Now, why is timing of implantation important? This is actually brand new work. It used to be thought that what DBS did was just treat the symptoms. We've now discovered that it actually slows the progression of disease. So that goes back to what I was talking about with the slope of decrement. We used to just have Parkinson patients that would progress, 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 and then they couldn't move anymore and oftentimes passed away. Now, with DBS, we found that we can actually change the slope of that progression from this to this. So it gives you a longer amount of quality life years, not just longer amount of years, but longer amount of quality life years where you're able to care for yourself, you're able to feed yourself, you're able to interact with your kids and families, you're able to go see your friends, you're able to go do the things you wanna do. So the, my subspecialty of neurosurgery is called functional neurosurgery. And the reason for that is that every surgery that we do, Parkinson, epilepsy, pain, psych, all of those surgeries, our goal is to give people more function. So that's, that's what DBS does. And lastly, I promised we would talk about where the, the implants go, this cross section of the brain here is if we slice through the head this way and we're looking from the front of the head. This would be the outside surface that sits right under the scalp there. This here, to give you an orientation, is the middle of the brain. This is the thalamus, which is the relay station of the brain and sends information everywhere else. And the two nuclei are the subthalamic nucleus, or STN, which are these little guys here and the GPI, which is a little bit more toward the outside on both sides there. Now, with DBS, we treat both sides of the brain simultaneously because Parkinson's, even if right now you only have one side that has symptoms, eventually does involve both sides of the body, so we treat both sides of the brain. Uh, now, uh, like we talked about with the potential for cognitive injury, the STN, the subthalamic nucleus, because it's more toward the middle and deeper, that one does have a higher risk of cognitive injury with the surgery, but it does treat tremor better than does the GPI. GPI doesn't do as well treating tremor, but it has a lower chance of cognitive injury. 
The flip side of that is that it also allows you to take more medication without the side effects because it treats the dyskinesias. Versus the STN will actually decrease the tremor and decrease the, the dependence on medication. So there are a lot of nuances to the selecting of the target and selecting of the patient together, but that is a discussion that we have in clinic as we approach the surgery and then jointly we make a decision on where we should implant. So I, I wanted to give you guys a background on DBS and what it is that I do, and now I'll open the floor to questions. Uh, so the, the gentleman asked uh, that I had mentioned side effects, and uh, he wanted me to discuss what potential side effects of uh, DBS are. Now, uh, it, it does depend on which nucleus we select and what your overall state of health and your pre-surgery uh, pre baseline are. Uh, with the STN, uh, there is a little bit higher risk of cognitive injury, which in almost all people actually resolves after about two weeks. Uh, so for two weeks, you're kind of a space cadet, and then two weeks later, you're, you're back to the way you were before surgery, but not everybody. For some people, it is permanent. Uh, memory loss, uh, executive dysfunction, planning dysfunction, uh, th things like that. Uh, and the, that question was, what are the cognitive side effects? Now, uh, with GPI, the side effect uh, will actually be facial pulling, where the, the face will start spasming in one direction, or difficulty speaking. Uh, and uh, they're not common. Uh, they're less than 1% after the surgery, but they do happen. Uh, then, of course, there are the general risks of brain surgery. Uh, anytime you make an incision in the skin, skin is the best barrier we have against infection. If you make an incision, you, you run the risk of infection. If you fall down and skin your knee, you get infection, no big deal. You take antibiotics, it's kind of the end of it. If you have hardware in your brain and it gets infected, the infection will actually track along the wire into your brain, and it can cause meningitis. With, uh, for that reason, if the hardware gets infected, it all has to come out. Now, most people are so happy with their symptom control that it buys them three surgeries. The first one to put it in, the second one to take it out, and the third one to put it back in. The next risk is that we actually hurt you by doing the surgery. And uh, stroke is a real risk during the surgery, either a bleeding stroke or a clotting stroke. Uh, the surgery itself, awake, is about three and a half hours. Asleep is about two and a half hours. But I spend a week before the surgery planning exactly where the electrode is going to go through the brain, through the tissue, around the blood vessels, to the nuclei that we're trying to go to. So all of the magic actually happens before you even get to the OR. Uh, despite all that, there is still a less than 1% chance of causing injury to your brain by doing surgery on your brain. And then the last risk, of course, is that nothing bad happens. Everything goes great. You get great control in the OR. We're all satisfied. Everybody's happy. We're high-fiving, chest bumping. And then after the surgery, it just turns out, for whatever reason, it doesn't work for you. If that happens, because there is a surgical risk of taking it out, we actually just turn the system off and leave it in unless there's a compelling reason to take it out, because it becomes a question of that risk calculus. Should we take it out and undergo the risk of surgery, or just turn it off and forget about it? All right, any other questions? The downside of leaving it implanted, that was the question. Uh, well, your bikini modeling career might be over. Uh, the, otherwise, there, there's not any downside. Pe people will see that you have the, the generator sitting under your, under your clavicle, but uh, it's, it's biologically inert material called silastic, and so the body does not react to it. It doesn't set off metal detectors, it doesn't cause uh, scar tissue to form, it doesn't cause, once it heals, it doesn't cause infection. So you, you leave it in and just leave it in. In some very few people, uh, they'll get a phenomenon called bowstringing, but that usually happens fairly early in having the, the device implanted. And uh, wh when that happens, there's a little bit of tension in the neck. And if we need to treat that, we just make a very small incision in the neck and cut that little bit of tissue that's gotten attached to the, the lead, and you go on your way. So the, the question was, uh, when I had mine done, I was told I couldn't go through a metal detector or get wanded. Uh, and that is no longer the case. Uh, the, uh, I'm guessing you had a Medtronic system? St. Jude. St. Jude actually doesn't exist anymore. It's, uh, it's now Abbott. Uh, yeah, they, they've bought the St. Jude technology. Uh, the, uh, was there a reason you, you did Abbott? Was it uh, Dr. Paradian that did your implant at UCLA? Really? Oh, they, they don't do many Abbott's up there. 
Got it. Well, you're welcome to come to me. I'm happy to take care of you. I, I, I can take care of any of the three systems, Boston, Medtronic, or Abbott. Uh, it, the, the Abbott system, uh, the old Abbott system, when they were still under the St. Jude umbrella, was magnetic. Uh, and so you did have that problem at the time. The current systems, now that they're under Abbott, no longer have that problem. So it, believe it or not, uh, just to summarize the question for the people on Zoom, uh, with the, the Abbott system uh, not being compatible, uh, is it the old system or, or are the wires the same? Actually, what has changed is neither the brain wire nor the generator, but what has changed is the extension wire between the brain and the, the battery. Uh, so that change made the new, new Abbott systems MRI compatible. Uh, not MRI compatible, the uh, metal detector compatible. Uh, the, uh, the Boston and the Medtronic systems are MRI compatible. Uh, I don't recall if the, Abbott, the current Abbott system is MRI compatible. Um, one, I was under the impression that the various like makers of the systems have different battery lives. Is that the case? And like, if so, I guess what are the battery lives? Sure. And, how, and what is the process of getting that replaced? So, in broad strokes, uh, if for all of the manufacturers, the non rechargeable batteries last between three and five years. Uh, depending on how much juice you need, uh, you, you may be on the shorter or the longer side of that. The nice thing about the non-rechargeable batteries is that you, it's sort of a fire and forget solution. So once you put it in, you don't worry about it until you come see me again and then I replace the battery. And the battery replacement surgery is, is kind of no big deal. It's a 15 minute surgery and you go home the same day. However, every time you violate the system, you run the risk of injuring the system. And if we injure the system, it becomes a much bigger deal. Plus, you run the risk of infection every time you open it. So for patients who can tolerate it and who, who have either the capacity themselves or have somebody that can help them, I always steer people toward the rechargeable batteries. Uh, it, and the reason for that is that the rechargeable batteries, although in the US we're only allowed to advertise 15 years, in Europe they've been using the rechargeable batteries for decades and they actually in practice last 25 years. Uh, so the rechargeable batteries in most people are the only battery they'll ever need. They, they usually will not outlive the rechargeability of the battery. Now, for that 14-year-old girl that I did, she probably would need a replacement, but most people wouldn't live long enough to need another one. Uh, and the rechargeable batteries also are much smaller, so they're cosmetically appealing because they're much easier to hide in the chest. And I didn't bring a charger with me, but the, the way you recharge it is just like the wireless charging on your cell phone, where there's a puck that has magnetic induction charging on it. You just lay it over your chest. It'll beep until it finds the battery. When it finds the battery, the beeping stops. You watch your TV show, brush your teeth, do what you need to do, and then when it starts beeping again, you know your battery's full and you take the battery off. So uh, to, to reiterate the answer to the question of how long the batteries last, uh, all of the non-rechargeable batteries last between three and five years, and the rechargeable batteries last, on average, 15 years. Uh, the current generation Medtronic non-recharge, excuse me, current generation Medtronic rechargeable uh, will last about 12 years, I've seen in real practice. The Boston will last longer than 15 years, and Abbott doesn't have a rechargeable. It's possible. Uh, so the, the question was that, that uh, the, the young lady had been told that uh, by another neurosurgeon that the non-rechargeable has some advantage in its ability to uh, finer tune programming as our understanding advances. So what he was talking about was the Medtronic Percept, which is one of the non-rechargeable batteries. And the reason it's called the Percept is because it can sense the brain signals. Fact of the matter is, we have no idea what to do with that information right now. Right, except that doesn't exist. Uh, the, that is the end goal for the Percept. And the, the ability to do it is hard-coded into the battery, but it is not turned on. Uh, because closed loop DBS is the ultimate goal, where the, the, uh, the generator senses what's going on in your brain by reading the brain signals and then responds by adjusting the electrical stimulation. But that technology hasn't even made it out of the animal models phase yet, let alone to people. Uh, so yes, in, in the long view, that is where it's headed. But that, that ability, uh, if I had to guess, would be between 10 and 20 years out. So the question was DBS compatibility with MRI. Uh, like I'd mentioned, I don't recall off the top of my head if Abbott is MRI compatible. Uh, I will find that out. Uh, but the uh, Medtronic uh, systems 
are MRI compatible to three Tesla. The Boston systems are MRI compatible to 1.5 Tesla. Uh, and uh, the mixed systems where you have Medtronic wires uh, with a Boston generator uh, are compatible to 1.5 Tesla. Now, most uh, MRI scanners out in the community in the real world are 1.5 Tesla. Uh, it's major academic centers and more wealthy boutique hospitals that'll have three Tesla or higher scanners. None of them are compatible with seven Tesla scanners. Uh, so uh, Stanford, I came from Stanford, so I, I can speak to what Stanford has. Stanford does have a seven Tesla scanner, but they also have multiple 1.5 and three Tesla scanners. So as long as you know which battery you have, you can still get an MRI. Medtronic is approved up to three Tesla, uh, but it's, uh, they're all MRI conditional which means that the center that scans you has to have very specific uh, control abilities on their MRI scanner. And something that I've been fighting here in town for the last two years is finding a center that will actually scan these patients uh, that have MRIs, uh, excuse me, that have DBSs in place. Uh, and we have now finally found an, an imaging center that has the right scanner with the right ability. It's called B plus RMS. Uh, the, uh, and it's a control that they have on their MRI machine that allows them to, to meet the conditionality requirements and scan patients that have DBS. Sierra View, that's it. I heard, I heard it in the background. Sierra View can do it. So it doesn't get shut off for the MRI. Uh, uh, the question was, how long can a patient go with the DBS shut off for the MRI? And that's actually two questions. Uh, the, the first part of it is the DBS doesn't need to be shut off for the MRI. Uh, they, they are MRI conditional as they are on. Uh, and the other question is, how long can a patient go with a DBS shut off? And a patient can go indefinitely with a DBS shut off. It's just as if you never had the DBS implanted. So the DBS is not a life-saving surgery. It is not removing a tumor or clipping an aneurysm. It's something that is designed to give you function back. Uh, so if it gets turned off, it's just as if you never had it. Now, with that said, I have had patients that have come back to me in clinic years after getting a DBS implanted, and they never charged it, so the battery died, and it just hasn't worked. And they'll say, well, you know, I, I have this DBS, and you made my Parkinson worse. It's not actually the case. They've come back seven to 10 years after their diagnosis and after their implantation. The disease has just progressed. The, DB, the DBS itself didn't make anything worse. Uh, and that's what DBS does. So uh, the DBS allows him to move. When you turn it off, you're unmasking the masked Parkinson's that he has. So when you turn it off, that's, that's him. That's his Parkinson's disease as it is today. Uh, so the tolerability of having it off is, is never life-threatening in the case of Parkinson's disease. It's just going to be really uncomfortable. Uh, when you turn it back on, it takes a little while for the, the efficacy to ramp up again. Uh, but it, again, it's not a life-threatening thing to turn off the DBS. Just very uncomfortable. The highest risk is when you first put it in. Uh, there, there are some very, very, very slow-growing bacteria. Uh, for example, Propionobacterium acnes, which it's called that because it's the bacteria that causes pimples. Uh, but that bacteria is very slow growing, and we have seen patients come back with an infection five, 10 years out of implantation. But the flip side of that is as, uh, because it is such a slow growing bacteria, it takes a very long time before it causes problems too, so it can be addressed easier. So the, the question was, uh, in paraphrase, how does a patient know when they're in the window or they've exceeded the window? Uh, it, it's a little bit difficult to know when you've exceeded the window as a patient because there is that emotional component of self also. You, you always want to think, well, I'll do it tomorrow, I still have time. Uh, so if you're, if you're looking at that side of the window where, where you're maybe exceeding the candidacy, just come see me and, and we'll do uh, what's called an on-off test where we test you, uh, do a physical exam on medication and a physical exam off medication, and we'll tell you where you fall. Uh, but as far as knowing when you've become a candidate for DBS, it's like I mentioned earlier, when you're taking enough medication that you're either having side effects or it's interrupting your life, uh, but it's still f uh, helping with the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, that's the time to come talk about DBS. Does that answer your question? One of the treatments that we offered at Stanford, we don't have it here yet, we will eventually, but one of the treatments that we offered at Stanford was focused ultrasound, which was a lesioning surgery for tremor. Focused ultrasound, where we use ultrasound waves to burn a portion of the brain. And 
almost uniformly, the patients that would get that, that procedure done uh, would come back and say, well, you know, the side that you treated, because focused ultrasound, you can only treat one side or the other. You can't treat both sides yet. Uh, so we would treat one side, and the tremor would go away completely. And they'd come back, and they'd say, listen, this side's great, but you made this side worse. And the reality is we never touched the other side. It's unmasked because the first side is now controlled. And I suspect what you're seeing is a combination of the disease itself progressing, where it's now involving the other side, and also because your left hand is now still, you're noticing the right side more, where before the left side was worse and you didn't really notice the right side as much. And I mean, I've met you 10 minutes ago, so I, I don't know if that's true, but that, uh, that, that would be the common answer to, to your question. Now, with that said, uh, as of right now, today, there are no movement disorder neurologists in Fresno. Uh, there are folks that see a lot of movement disorder patients, but they're not movement disorder neurologists. May 1st, uh, I've hired a guy to start in my clinic who is a movement disorder neurologist. So May 1st, we will have a movement disorder neurologist in town. Uh, his name is Eric Farbman, F-A-R-B-M-A-N. Uh, and he, he and I share an office on Fresno Street, and uh, you know, come see him. Uh, he'll, he'll help you with managing the medications. Now, I, I'm a surgeon. I don't manage medications, but he's a neurologist, so he does. Uh, the question was, if you've had focused ultrasound uh, as an attempt, can you then have DBS? No. You can have DBS and then focused ultrasound, but you cannot have focused ultrasound and then DBS. Uh, the reason being is that DBS requires the presence of otherwise normal anatomy in order to place the lead where it needs to go. If you have focused ultrasound, you, you have very literally destroyed the tissue that you're putting the lead in. And so there is no conductive tissue for the electricity to flow through. So if you have DBS and you're not satisfied with it or you want a more permanent solution, you can have DBS and then focused ultrasound, but not the other way around. Eric Farbman, F-A-R-B-M-A-N. And he'll be starting May 1st. Uh, so let me restate the question, and then I'll answer it. Uh, the, the question was that, that I had said earlier that we found that DBS slows the progression of the disease. Why wouldn't it be recommended that it done, uh, be done earlier rather than later? So again, it's, it's a little bit of a nuanced question. So if you'll humor me, I'll give you kind of an extended answer. Uh, it, the, the old way of thinking was that it was a salvage therapy, so everybody relegated it to the end of the line when nothing else would work anymore. Then we started realizing that it didn't really help if we did it as a salvage therapy, so we started doing it uh, earlier in that late stage Parkinson uh, window. Still not a great time, but better than at the end stage. Now, with the understanding that it does actually slow the progression of Parkinson's disease, we are doing it earlier and earlier, but still within that golden window. And the reason we reserve that golden window is the patient that takes one levodopa at night and goes to bed, and then they're fine for the whole 24 hours until they take it again, they haven't uh, shown or uh, they, they haven't gotten to a stage where the surgical risk of DBS is worth it. Now, when they get to a point where they're increasing from two to three uh, centimet a day, and maybe they're, they're not getting as good control of the tremor as they once were, then that's early enough where we will slow the progression of the disease, but advanced enough where the surgical risk is justified. So the, uh, the, the number in that Nature paper uh, was uh, that it slows the disease on average by uh, 3.8 quality adjusted life years. That's uh, kind of a fancy metric that's used in the literature, uh, meaning that it's actually more than 3.8 years of life. But if you factor in quality life, the, the, uh, the number of years that it gives you of quality life is 3.8. So TMS uh, has been extensively studied. TMS actually, let me, sorry, let me restate the question. Have there been any studies on transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS uh, for Parkinson's disease, I'm assuming? So the uh, TMS on the whole has been extensively studied for a very long time. Uh, and the, the efficacy is pretty good. Uh, but the problem with TMS is that the effect is temporary. Uh, so essentially, a TMS, the, the way it works, uh, is it works as a very powerful, very focal MRI machine uh, where it zaps a focal area of the brain and uh, it, it basically scrambles the signal coming from that portion of the brain for a period of time. Now, the brain doesn't like to be scrambled. 
And when that scrambling happens and the brain has the ability to do so, it'll fix the pathway or find another pathway around it. The on-ramp is closed, so it takes surface streets. Uh, and so ultimately, usually after a period of about three months, the, the symptoms will come back exactly as they would have had you not had the TMS. Uh, but TMS is, uh, is a modulatory system in the same way that DBS is, but DBS is implanted, and so it's continuously providing electricity. And yes, that stimulation is temporary. If you turn off the DBS, it'll stop working. But if you keep the stimulation going, you keep having efficacy. Versus the TMS is non-invasive, and that's, that's the nice part about it, is that you get zapped and then you go home. Uh, but it would require you coming into the doctor's office over and over and over and over to keep getting re-zapped if you want to keep having the efficacy. No. So the, the question was vibration therapy. You're talking about the, the glove from Peter Tass? I don't know much about the chiropractic stuff, but uh, Peter is, uh, is up at Stanford, and I, I know him quite well, and uh, his, his glove actually works incredibly well. Uh, it, it works best, actually, where DBS doesn't work. So it works best for the very late-stage Parkinson patients. Uh, and what it does, essentially, is it overstimulates the brain pathway uh, that responds to inappropriate movement. Now, when your body generates an inappropriate movement to a degree other than, than perhaps uh, being kind of consciously aware of it, uh, where, where there might be some social embarrassment associated with the tremor, uh, in most Parkinson patients, this is just how their lives are, so they don't even notice the tremor anymore when they're walking around, versus the, the uh, stimulation glove, TUS stimulation glove, it overstimulates that tremor in a way, and so the brain becomes more acutely aware of it and shuts it down. Uh, but the, uh, the efficacy of the glove, like I said, generally is for patients that, that have already exceeded uh, DBS candidacy. Works fantastic in those patients, though. Uh, so it, it is not technically FDA approved yet. Uh, it, it is in the conditional approval phase from the FDA. Uh, it, as far as the commercial availability of it, uh, Pete actually hasn't been able to get parts for a while because of supply chain, just like anybody else. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I, I, I moved here in August. I ordered a couch the day I moved in, uh, and it still hasn't been delivered. So, so <laughs> uh, say, same as, uh, same as uh, Pete's issue with getting components for his glove. So uh, as soon as he gets parts, yeah, he'll build them and send them out. Uh, but there is a delay in getting them, not, not because of him, not because of approval, but just the parts aren't out there. The, the question was risks associated with a tactile stimulation glove, and I made a joke that, uh, you know, you look funny, but other than that, no, there are no risks associated with it. So that, that research is uh, a little bit stymied by uh, some of the political climate that we've had. Uh, the, the question was what happened to stem cell research uh, in Parkinson's disease, and uh, what I was saying is that research is a little bit stymied uh, by the political climate uh, because uh, the, the stem cells required for nervous tissue are definitionally embryonic stem cells, and uh, a lot of the more zealous opponents of uh, embryonic research have made it very difficult and costly to do that research. Uh, so the, the work is still ongoing, but it's very slow going, and there, there hasn't been much meaningful progress yet. So the stem cells that you have as an adult are pluripotent, meaning they, they can become a lot of things, but the embryonic stem cells are omnipotent, meaning they can become anything. Uh, and that's the reason that, that the embryonic stem cells are needed for nervous tissue and why, uh, it, with the, a few exceptions, adult nervous tissue doesn't regenerate. So somebody that gets shot in the head is not going to regrow half the brain that, that got shot away. Uh, we just don't have that capability as humans. Uh, so the adult stem cells will not regrow nervous tissue. They can regrow other things uh, and be modified to regrow most things, but not nervous tissue. Yeah, so uh, like I said, DBS is not a required surgery. It, it's something that helps in your Parkinson journey. It helps control the symptoms. It helps delay the progression of Parkinson's disease and decrease the rapidity of progression. But it, it is not something that will stop Parkinson's disease. It is not a cure. Uh, it stops for the same reason that, that you basically don't control movements while you sleep, is the, those basal ganglia circuits that, that we modify in DBS uh, they, they get shut down during sleep. So uh, uh, in, have you heard of REM sleep? Rapid eye movement sleep? 
So in REM sleep, your body actually goes into a state of paralysis to prevent you from acting out your dreams. And one of the problems with Parkinson's disease, especially in the later stages, is dream enactment, where they have dreams and they start moving around in response to their dreams. So that, that shutdown circuit also gets affected in Parkinson's disease. But for the moment, it, yours seems to be preserved. Well, it uh, uh, could be a whole host of things. The, uh, the, the sort of uh, biggest thunder there is that you may have been mis misdiagnosed initially. You may have a different condition other than Parkinson's disease. And I'm not saying you do or don't. I'm saying you may. Uh, uh, or you may have an environmentally responsive tremor. You may have other factors that influence your tremor that, that are not present here or in Oakland, but are present in Hanford. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's a, a very long discussion to have that's a bit outside the scope here. Uh, but you're welcome to come by the clinic and we can figure out what's going on. Got it. So the DAT scan has a, a specific contrast medium that is not the same as the uh, iodine contrast in the MRI, uh, but it is a contrasted scan. It, it's not necessarily unusual uh, in somebody that had the onset of symptoms so young. Uh, so a, a young brain has a lot of uh, sort of bypass roads that as we age get pruned away. And so it would not be unusual for somebody that, that had onset of Parkinson's at 29 or earlier to, to do well on medications. Uh, conversely, that girl I talked about that I implanted at 14, uh, there's actually a small population in Mexico uh, where everybody in that town gets Parkinson's disease and they all get it extraordinarily young, usually in their mid to late teens. Uh, and for them, there's the genetic and the environmental component that can contributes to it, so they become very insensitive to medication very quickly because of the genetic piece. In his case, he has true idiopathic Parkinson's disease, the, the same as most people, where, where it, it just comes from we don't know where. Uh, and because he had young onset, he does stay responsive longer. Uh, but the flip side, of course, is that having been on medication for 30 years, he, he is going to start approaching the end of his responsiveness to medication. That, that town is very near a chemical plant that manufactures a lot of uh, pesticides. Uh, and, you know, just, just like Fresno and Hanford, uh, there, there are a lot of environmental pesticides that do contribute to Parkinson's disease. But they, they have a particular gene line called PARK1, PRK1, uh, where those patients are many times more likely to manifest Parkinson's disease than would, if you'll pardon the phrase, normal people. No, and in fact, not many do. Uh, there, there is genetic Parkinson's and there is idiopathic. Idiopathic means it came from somewhere, but we don't know where. Genetic, obviously, is genetic. Uh, and uh, genetic Parkinson's does respond to DBS. Uh, however, the targeting is different. Uh, and that, that is certainly outside the scope of the talk today, but I'm happy to talk with you about it in person. Just drop by the clinic and we'll chat. On Zoom, we have somebody from the UCLA PEG study. Um, yeah, so my name is Irish and I, um, I'm the project manager for the Parkinson's Environment and Gene Study. Um, and the study has been going on for over 23 years now. And we do have 2000 participants in the Kern, Fresno and Tulare counties. Uh, so some of you might already be participating, um, but we are opening um, recruitment and enrollment because we'll be in Fresno on April 13. Um, what the study is about is um, we're trying to look into how bacteria in our gut may play a role in brain health. Uh, we're also looking at environmental factors that may um, increase risks for Parkinson's disease um, or alternatively be protective of Parkinson's disease. Um, so in order to participate, um, you can call our number. It's down in that green box below. Um, and what you will do when you decide to participate is um, you will be seen by a movement disorder specialist at UCLA. Um, we will collect stool and blood samples um, and also collect an interview about your life and um, your lifestyle and um, your history. And that interview, depending on, um, on how much, how many times you moved, et cetera, it could take one hour up to three hours. Um, and you will be eligible if you, if you have Parkinson's disease um, and diagnosed within the past five years and live in California the last five years and currently live in Fresno, Kern, or Tulare.
um, you will be paid uh, 25 to hundred dollars for your participation in the study um, and we do everything locally or over the phone or over zoom um, and again our study phone number is below so you can feel free to contact that number at 866-519-1795 or you can also email us at pegstudy at mednet.ucla.edu um, and you will also be mailed this information in the newsletter. Um, so some of our study team who will be seeing you, um, it, the PI, the primary investigator for the study is Dr. Ritz. She's an epidemiologist focused on environmental epidemiology and health. Um, and our two movement disorder specialists are Dr. Jeff Bronstein and Adrian Keener. Um, and Jonathan Jacobs is one of our microbiome gut specialists. So um, I don't know um, if anybody has questions on that. Um, I, I can't really hear the main room, so. Um, we have, do we have any questions? No questions? Okay. Um, do you have anything else that you would like to say, Irish? Um, no, that's just all. We'll send out the newsletter. We will be in Fresno on April 13th. Um, so we'd more than, be more than happy to see some of you if you're interested in participating study and just contact us if you do have additional questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and then uh, for those of you who have received the newsletter, you probably already saw uh, Dr. Bhatia is also conducting a study. He's He's a clinical researcher on a team for the research being done. It's for Tempo Studies, and they have a new um, dopamine agonist that they're checking to see how effective it is. Um, so it's for people who are recently diagnosed who are not taking any dopamine uh, medications currently, or for somebody who has been on a dopamine medication for an extended period of time. We have brochures if you're interested and you can always come and talk to me afterwards as well. And then I wanna also make a quick announcement about this speech therapy program over at Fresno State. It is free. And if you have not taken advantage of it, I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, my philosophy is early intervention is the best. Um, so even if you're not having difficulty with your speech now, if you're not having difficulty with your swallowing now, Get on those exercises. Don't let it become a problem. Um, and they're a, they're a wonderful resource, and it's free. And there's flyers over there for that as well. Any questions? Anything? All right. <laughs>